Uh, thank you very much for our roundtable one. And uh, next is the second thematic roundtable discussion focusing financing for gender equality from a public policy perspective. Please welcome our moderator, Her Excellency Miranda Linai, the Deputy Head of Kenya to China, please. Good afternoon, distinguished guests, um, Director General, Ms. Yang, a representative of SIDCA, Mabel, Director, and SG from CCG. Um, thank you so much to the UN Women in China and Madam Smitri for inviting me to moderate this session. I'd like to say I'm a young woman in STEM, and I also want to wish fellow women here an International Women's Day. So to my lovely panelists on my left, um, we are very short of time. So our session today is quite engaging. We've seen on social media the issue of financing for gender equality. And I'm sure you'll bear with us if we try and move away from the time. And it is my dis dis distinguished honor to also acknowledge the entire UN fraternity led by my big sister there, Makobe, who's given me the opportunity to moderate. Um, today, I would like to set the tone for this next engagement because we are going to wear our public policy lens and we are going to try and look at what instruments, whether from a legal perspective, whether it is our regulatory frameworks, what is it that our governments are doing to lead by policy design, to lead in terms of incentivizing the work on financing for gender equality. And with that being said, it is my honor to start us off with His Excellency, um, the Ambassador to Rwanda, James Karibusana. And we do know that our countries have advanced their cause in developing and designing national strategies on gender. And we do appreciate countries like Rwanda that are leading in this national gender strategy. If you may allow me, Your Excellency, I would like to dig deeper on how Rwanda has been able to prioritize gender equality and women's empowerment into actual tangible policy incentives and resource allocation. Today, we are grappling with very um, financial systems that are not inclusive. And we do want to hear what Rwanda then has been able to hear. And if you may add the report on Global Gender Gap Report 2023 ranks Rwanda among the top 10 countries for narrowing the gender gap. And in this regard, the UN Women has worked with you Rwanda to actively promote women's equal benefits from governance systems to enhancing access to social protection. Over to you to speak to us more on your government's incentives. Uh, thank you very much, uh, my sister Mende, and um, uh, thank you, Smirit and uh, uh, Dr. Mebo for inviting me. And I want to start by joining others to congratulate women and wish you a happy International Women's Day. Uh, the previous panel uh, touched on very, very important issues, and I want to begin my uh, submission on uh, uh, what Beat said, uh, that uh, the issue of uh, uh, gender equality and women empowerment is a fundamental human rights issue. And secondly, it is a very crucial ingredient of socioeconomic development. And once you have that perspective, then the approach to all these issues we are discussing becomes easier. But I want to state here that uh, the elephant in the room is political will to deal with these fundamental challenges that we face when it comes to ensure equality. That's where the problem lies. The moment you don't realize that in some of our societies, women are the majority in our population, that they have the capacity like men, and you don't give them access the positions that make or define and determine their destiny, then you are missing the point. Now, because we are running short of time, let me say that um, the starting point 
the cornerstone of what Rwanda has achieved in the past years is based on this understanding. And for us to be able to execute programs that are meant to ensure equality across our society, we had to start with the constitution. So Rwanda's constitution of 2003, as amended in 2015, provides for fighting any all forms of discrimination, including ensuring gender equality, because as it was said, this is a fundamental human rights issue. And therefore, for you to be able to achieve that, you have the political need, but that's not the end of it all. What is the policy and legal framework that is in place? What are the instruments that you have put in place as a government to make sure that this vision is going to be achieved? Now, there is a whole list of policies, the whole list of laws that have been enacted in Rwanda to ensure that women have access to everything that men have access to. If you look at uh, the uh, national agenda policy, for instance, it clearly, and it has been revised several times, it clearly provides a framework through which all stakeholders act to make sure that they implement the national agenda policy in whatever they do, in the public and the private institutions. But there's a challenge here. If you're asking a private company to implement gender equality and women empowerment, how do they do it? It's not because they have made a political statement. You have to have an instrument that enables them to be able to do that. Well, you may need with the mindset, reluctance to do it, but you have to have that instrument. In that respect, Rwanda has developed national gender standards so that these standards are given to everyone, public and private institutions. What do you mean by gender equality and women empowerment? When it comes to employment, you have a project and you want 100 employees. What do the standards provide for you to be able to have that in mind? And, and you, you have to put in place really very effective institutional arrangement for this to happen. You start with the ministry in charge of gender, but you must have an oversight institution that looks at what is happening across the board. And this aspect, we want to put in place what we call gender monitoring office which is a standalone entity that is responsible to make sure that all these laws and the policies and the standards are executed within the public and private institutions. And because of this, we have seen a lot of progress, even in places where we didn't expect people to be very cautious about gender equality and women empowerment. Again, for this to happen, you have to make sure that women are at the table of every decision-making process. Because in the first five years of implementing this vision, there was this tendency of uh, coming up with a budget for an institution, say, Minister of Transport, and then they just provide for 20% is going to go for women regardless of whether they are qualified or they're interested, they have the cap of 20% to, to participate in any transport or infrastructure project. But if you don't bring women at the table of discussion, and let me just take a very quick example of a project. During the project planning, if you miss out all stakeholders, you may come up with a project that does not include the ideas of all stakeholders. Unless if we have people want to assume that women are irrelevant at the stage when you are designing the priorities for the communities or for the country or for the ministry. That's number one. When you set the priority, the next step is to set the programs. Because you want education for all, how do you do it? The Higher Education Council of Rwanda 
is an institution that deals with scholarships. How do you deal with the issue of ensuring that you have girls going to science or engineering uh, degrees and programs? You have to sit with women, and I'm saying institutional arrangement is very critical. You have women, National Women Council, you have gender monitoring office, you have Minister of Gender, and you have private sector federation for women. They are all sitting at the table when you are developing the program, okay. and then budgeting, and then execution, and then monitoring. Now, if the program doesn't reflect gender equality and women empowerment, my friend, you walk to the Minister of Finance and Planning, you never get a single dime. Mm. That's wow. absolutely a no-go. Thank you so much. So you've set the tone correctly. And I think we wanted to hear at the bedrock of it all, the government does need to lead by example, as Rwanda has. And that is preparing that conducive environment through the policy instruments that allows other sector players to even thrive in like now the private sector. And that takes me to South Africa because there's something His Excellency has talked about, the procurement spending, which is something also I'd like to share before South Africa. The government of Kenya also took the same approach in embedding that policy, our legal framework under our constitution of Kenya, such that we have the access to government procurement opportunities for women-led enterprises. And now we give 30% legally embedded in our law to the women-led businesses. And as you can hear from Ambassador James, he has a vast wealth of experience to share because he has really led um, and been instrumental in the political and socioeconomic reforms in Rwanda for the last 13 years, where he has held several key positions in government. Thank you very much. Now to South Africa, we want to hear more about the inclusive financial system. And that is very particular to the procurement because we do know in South Africa, the president has announced a substantial commitment back into 2020 as a central piece of the country's COVID-19 recovery plan, 40% of government procurement spending going towards the women-owned businesses. Kindly, Your Excellency, I'm Ambassador Siabonga, who has been appointed to cabinet in several key ministerial positions. Could you share with us how this could be incentivized and linked to financing women empowerment? Thank you. Thank you very much for the organizers for inviting us to this uh, panel. This month, month of March, is known we are celebrating as a human rights month to celebrate those who were massacred, women and men, in 1961 or resisting apartheid laws in South Africa. In that context, the women empowerment in our country is about dealing with the legacy of apartheid and transformation of society, particularly transformation of power relations. Uh, uh, power relations between women, men, and institution and laws. It is also about addressing gender oppression, patriarchy, sexism, and structural op uh, oppression. As Nelson Mandela once said, <clears throat> you empower a woman, you empower a nation. Close quotes. We believe that when women are empowered, we see their families thrive, community safer, and our economy growing. Through the inclusion of more women in the economy, we can also stop the generational poverty and stimulate economic growth. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, the starting point, as my colleague has said, is our constitution that provides the enabling framework and guiding the introduction of these policies and laws to enforce transformation, non-discrimination, non-sexism, and the equality of women in our country. And uh, these are uh, Legal framework includes laws that govern social economic development and protection and promotion of women's human rights and dignity. The government of South Africa has introduced these programs 
that specifically target women to facilitate their participation in the mainstream economy, employment equity, and economic transformation that enables women have, have equal access and control to our economic resources. Today, I'll just focus on five humble but very significant uh, financial normative policies framework uh, which are in relation to women. The first one is the Women Empowerment Fund which was established uh, in 2014 as part of our National Empowerment Fund, which uh, uh, to firmly drive the value and volume of approvals and disbursement to businesses that are owned and managed by women, particularly black women, by, making the, by providing them with capital. Because without providing, creating these instruments, we can talk good policy. So there's an instrument which has been created by government. This fund <clears throat> starts from about 250,000 South African rands right to up to 75 million across a range of sectors for startups, expansions, and equity acquisition purposes. The National Empowerment Fund has at, uh, over 10 years, <clears throat> uh, over 10 billion, 10, over one plus, 11 billion to support over 100 black owned businesses countrywide. However, over the past 10 years, 40% of this fund has been allocated to women. We would like it to have been over 50% in terms of our policy. The second instrument is gender responsive planning, budgeting, monitoring, evaluating, and auditing framework. The issues we we're talking about earlier on, they relate to this policy. It protects the <clears throat> rights of women and girls in South Africa. The framework seek to ensure that the planning instruments at the national, subnational, sectoral, institutional, and program level are gender, are gender responsive, and that sufficient resources are located to interventions which contribute to women's empowerment and, and gender equality. The third one is employment. Equity Act seeks to achieve the equity at the workplace through the promotion of equality opportunities and fair treatment in employment and eliminate it of any unfair discrimination and also implement affirmative action measures to redress the disadvantages experienced by designated group, particularly women. The fourth one is the promotion of equality and prevention of unfair discrimination act. This prohibits any, for any form of unfair discrimination. It prohibits any system that prevents women from inheriting family property, which was a big problem in the past, which unfairly limit access, a women's access to land rights, limits anything which limits women's access to financing and other resources. So that's quite significant. The last one is the amendment of our Labor Relations Act and the basic conditions of um, Employment Act, which were amended in 2020. Particular issues are due today is only about parental leave, maternity leave, and benefits and uh, night shifts and conditions of service. All these have been made to be gender, uh, gender responsive. The act has been amended basically to ensure that although these leaves are unpaid leave, but women now can claim this under our unemployment uh, insurance fund without limiting other benefits from that fund. Those are some of the humble measures we're implementing once more. Happy Women's Day. Thank you. So allow me before you pass on the microphone to take you a little bit back because we are keen on hearing the tangible outcomes. So I'll take you back to the Women Empowerment Fund in less than a minute. Could you likely share with us what has been achieved, one or two things, since you introduced the gender responsive procurement policy and a fund? So maybe the low hanging fruits that you can share a lesson or two. 
the, the first thing is really is the participation of women in our economy. It's been quite significant because they tend to participate in uh, small businesses which tend to generate more jobs, which is a major challenge in South Africa. That's why we get encouraged to increase this funding. I've mentioned that uh, at the beginning, it was very slow uptake, but the uptake now of women participation of all these funds and opportunities, even government procurement, like you said, uh, is the biggest enabler. And but you must have a monitoring tool, and that monitoring tool, because it's in the presidency. So when we meet at any planning meeting of cabinet, then people must give an account why their department or institutions are not complying, those who are falling behind. So that's what has been very innovative and very significant in pushing the participation of women and making sure that they are participating effectively in the economy. Thank you, Your Excellency, for sharing those tangible outcomes from the gender responsive policies and some of the things the government in South Africa has done to improve financing for gender equality. It's my sincere pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Mr. Yang Yong, the Director of the Institute of Market and Price Research at the National Development and Reform Commission of China. Yeah. Kindly, could you share with us, first of all, how then as a policymaker, because sometimes we sit here as the policy practitioners, on the other side of making policy, we would really be happy to hear from your insights on the most relevant policies, instruments, and frameworks that are designed to incentivize financing and empowerment opportunities for women and girls from a perspective of policy design. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. I come from the national uh, NDRC and uh, in about uh, last uh, July or August, and uh, we have established uh, a Bureau of uh, Civil Economy. And uh, since uh, the establishment uh, of this bureau, and uh, we seconded two of our employees to this bureau. In addition, we have also participated in some paper drafting. And uh, one of this uh, very important uh, scheme is uh, that uh, which will be drafting on the private economy promoting law of China, and uh, which is uh, basically to encourage a fair competition. And in my opinion, in terms of uh, this uh, draft law, uh, and uh, prior to submitting this uh, to the two sessions, and uh, we need to continue to enhance uh, gender equality. And for this uh, Law and uh, what uh, we focus on is uh, on the basis of a fair competition, and uh, there is uh, a fairness of ownership. So, which means uh, that uh, for gender equality and. Uh, Perhaps uh, in the past, we have not given it uh, equal focus and attention, and this is something that we need to continue to work on in the future. We are also reflecting on our work in terms of the policy making and in terms of the policy making department. They need to be aware of uh, gender equality and in terms of uh, policy implication departments, and they need to be even more aware of this. Uh, however, in some of our areas in society, and uh, we do not yet see this. And uh, this may be something going forward in terms of establishing the mechanism. This is something that we need to work on. And in 1995, whilst I was uh, working in the social development department of NDRC, we participated in the World Women's Congress, and we participated in the document preparation stage, and it's almost 30 years now, and we are still sitting here discussing about this topic. I have also seen that uh, a data provided by the uh, Federation of uh, the Chinese Commerce 
uh, uh, an industry. And uh, so in the young generation of uh, female entrepreneurs, and uh, the figure is 24.9%. Uh, and uh, after 25 years or almost 30 years since our last World Women's Congress, we have seen the women entrepreneurship improving from 19% to 24.9%. However, there is still room for us to further improve. And uh, in terms of uh, digital economy and with the development of digital economy for um, micro and uh, small business and uh, females are better at uh, using digital platforms. And uh, in the digital economy, if we look at uh, the female ownership, and it's actually more than 40% in the meantime in terms of their operation, and they are more patient, they're more resilient, uh, their business are more likely to last with a higher profit margin. And this is uh, something that's uh, very happy for everyone to see. In addition, in terms of uh, completing and perfecting our education, and this can help women progress. And uh, in about uh, 10 years ago, People's University, this is a university of arts, and uh, females' uh, percentage has uh, reached about 55%. Some of the old professors, they say that we cannot continue this way. However, this is a wrong idea. and. Uh, Right now, we can see that in master's degree, 60% female, and in PhD, uh, 65%. And uh, it is uh, likely that uh, women are more dedicated to their studies, and they have the patience to sit down and do the work, and they are the biggest beneficiaries of Chinese uh, uh, tertiary education. And in the meantime, in China, generally speaking, women live longer by uh, compared with women uh, with men by two to three years. They are the ones uh, who can actually benefit and uh, uh, receive more cash flow from the pension funds. So finally, I would also like to say that uh, we need to continue to work on the assessment mechanism on gender equality. And in Shandong province, they have actually done extremely well. And uh, for instance, uh, the ones that are currently in the legislation mechanism and uh, looking at uh, establishing law, etc. And uh, they have done their due diligence and carried out analysis and uh, uh, evaluation work. They are fully implementing gender equality. Uh, as well as uh, looking at it from a policy perspective. So for me, in my opinion, and I think that uh, for a policy implementation process and uh, carrying out uh, the assessment, evaluation, and the feedback for public policies, and uh, it's uh, uh, perfection thereof. This is of extremely uh, helpful, and I think that uh, the experience of uh, Shandong province uh, can be further expanded and rolled out to the rest of China. In the interest of time, I'd like to stop here, and uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity. True to a researcher, he has provided statistics and evidence-based data that drives our policymakers. And of course, because of time, I would like to come back to you um, later, just to give us more of the decision-led policymaking from a data perspective and specifically sharing one example and a good practice where those incentives you've mentioned to us, you've told us the women after conducting research, you've seen that they are good and prospering in the digital economy. You've said that they're even taking up more education opportunities, not only in a PhD and master's, but in tertiary education, where they'll gain the relevant and uh, practical skills to even enhance our key driven um, sectors for the economy. So maybe you can share with us one example where you think this very um, intentional policy making has made a difference in actual practice. And it is my sincere honor to introduce our next panelist, Her Excellency Ambassador Jennifer May. Ambassador of Canada to China, um, who has been a strong advocate for gender equality and women's empowerment by developing institutions, developing policies, tools, and accountability structures to promote gender equality. 
Welcome very much. Um, through the Canadian Gender Budgeting Act, if you may allow me to uh, reference that, Canada has been able to put enormous emphasis, enormous emphasis and efforts in ensuring gender equality and fairness and inclusion considerations, something that we are grappling with, the inclusivity. And therefore, this has even translated to the Canadian annual federal budget. And today we're very keen to hear about this gender responsive budgeting. Um, Your Excellency, if you may share with us briefly, how has the government been able not only to prioritize gender equality into policy incentives and resource allocation? We want to hear more about the underlying policy tools, especially through the Gender Budgeting Act that you've advanced um, gender responsive budgeting through. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy, and thank you all for this opportunity. Perhaps before moving straight into the finance um, specificity of it, I think it may be helpful to see a little bit of the journey uh, that Canada has been on uh, quite literally over the past several decades. So we've long had a framework uh, which is called, called the um, Employment Equity Act that looked at how do we promote and support diverse groups within uh, within Canada, and that has been in the government system. And so that has included women. It's also what we call visible minorities, uh, people with disabilities and indigenous peoples. And that has been around for decades. And so therefore, if all it took was one good law, then we'd be there and done and it would be over. And in fact, that's not the case. And uh, we are coming at this therefore very much from a position of humility and recognition of intersectionality, systemic discrimination, and that we have to come at these issues not simply from a matter of looking at what's the outcome and how do we get it in an almost transactional way, but really how do we systemically change the dialogue and the processes that will allow us then to get to the outcomes that we want. So... Um, from that, in terms of the legal framework that others have mentioned as being very important, the, the absolute basic for us has been our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which guarantees equal protection and benefit of the law without discrimination. So when we take that as our basis and we move on to that, a next piece of pivotal, pivotal legislation has been the Employment Equity Act, also the Pay Equity Act, the Canadian Gender Budgeting Act. And so... You know, when we put the, the, uh, the Gender Budgeting Act, it's within a framework and a systemic um, institutional framework that makes it one piece of many, of many parts. So they don't just encapsulate our vision for a more equal society, but they also really demonstrate how we've evolved in integrating gender perspectives into the heart of our policymaking processes. So the inclusive approach starts with the Canadian Gender Budgeting Act. And it was uh, implemented as an innovative framework that mandates gender-based analysis plus which we shorten as GBA plus for all budgetary measures, ensuring that our fiscal policies advance gender equality and empower all individuals. We have required every single public servant in Canada to do training on GBA plus. Uh, so it's one of those things. And there was also a big campaign around it where we were all, as you did it, you got your certificate and you'd put it on your door and encourage others to, to be taking it on as well. So that was kind of the, the build up towards it. Uh, and then in 2021, we had uh, our budget had GBA plus summaries for over 300 budget measures. And they had to describe how equality measures were considered in the government's effort to build a fairer and more prosperous future. So I think you know the key takeaway I would say is that it's really been it's about institutionalizing it as opposed to kind of having it a measure that one group does, whether it's a finance ministry or, or women in the finance ministry or whatever it is, but it's really been a responsibility for all of us and that the intersectionality has to be built into it, that you can't put forward a budget measure without showing your GBA plus analysis. Um, as we've heard from others, this is part of a global trend, uh, and I think that's another part of that uh, enabling environment that's been important as well, that whether it's the International Monetary Fund, um, and we're uh, telling us that more than half of G20 countries have a legal framework that requires gender goals being in, uh, incorporated in the budget. So again, it's that mainstreaming, I think, that makes it really, really um, powerful. It is a, um, having a gender analysis a legislative requirement elevates gender equality from a peripheral concern to a central pillar of our national strategies and vision. So beyond the legislative framework, there are also other domestic targeted programs and funding mechanisms for civil society organizations, such as those administered by Canada's Department for Wind, uh, Women and Gender Equality. 
And so these include the women's program, which supports initiatives for the full participation of women in our economic, social, and democratic life. The gender-based violence program, which funds programs that enhance prevention and provide support for survivors and their families and create more robust legal and justice responses. And the equality for sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression program. So I want to finally just speak a little bit to Canada's feminist forum policy and how it has applied to all of our areas of international engagement. So again, in terms of the enabling environment, the feminist forum policy, um, and in particular also the international assistance uh, portfolio of it, requires each and every one of us as we go into leadership positions and our missions to look at what more can we do to support women's advancement. And the idea is not to say, here's the policy from the center, uh, and it will be applied the same, whether it's in Kenya, Rwanda, South Africa, Canada, uh, the United Nations, United uh, States, uh, United Kingdom, no matter what, that we're going to have one size fits all. But really that we should be trying to engage uh, with our local environment and with our local partners in a way to maximize uh, and to say that it doesn't matter if you're a female ambassador. Uh, it matters that you're representing Canada and that this is policy uh, as opposed to a personal project. Uh, so uh, we've had a number of agendas, though, that have gone across uh, the, our system. And it, it's been also about repositioning where we put uh, sexual and reprodu reproductive health rights, uh, how we look at uh, care work inequalities, how we look at supporting and strengthening women's rights organizations, and how we support programs like the Women's Voice and Leadership Program and the Equality Fund. So I'm happy to hear that we are working on closing gender gaps um, and supporting achieving the sustainable development goals, um, and that we are now the top OECD ranked donor for the share of our aid supporting gender equality. And I, when I say the number, it's going to be pretty hard to beat, uh, because according to the latest stats, in 2021-22, 99% of Canada's bilateral international development assistance either targeted or integrated gender equality results. Wow. So. But what I'll say is that it, it comes from starting with that's the outcome. That's where we want to land. And so it's by design. It's not that that's the shift that happened. And I think before the, the statistic before we went out this lens, I think it was 35 percent, which was not bad. But it, mm. I think that kind of showed that if that wasn't central where you would land, as opposed to saying that's our goal and lining up the programming around it. Right. We also spearhead something called the ELSI initiative to enhance women's participation in UN peace operations. And we launched the Peace by Her campaign to support women peace builders. And so for those of you who aren't steeped in um, international peace and security, the ELSI initiative looked at bringing in women into peacekeeping roles as part of the civilian police, as part of the military uh, UN operations, and saying that the best way to support peace development and to counter gender-based violence was by having women right in and built in yes. uh, and in, in important key roles. And that, that the key goal of the ELSI initiative is to get women into over 27.5% of those positions. Now, that's a pretty specific uh, yes. number. And where does that come from? And you've been asking us for data-driven. Yes. Uh, so it comes out of um, studies that show that if you are below 27%, Women feel that they have to represent all women, uh, that they are not there representing their own specific individual voice, but rather that they feel constrained by the environment around them. So by trying to get above 27%, and ideally heading towards 50%, but that that 27% being a threshold where women are no longer feeling tokened, but really feel empowered, and that has a, a very uh, key difference in terms of how they're able to engage on these mm -hmm. issues. So um, we also have a trade diversity diversification strategy that has gender mainstreaming as part of it, uh, as well as for Indigenous and women-owned businesses. Every single free trade agreement that Canada now signs not only has a chapter on women-led businesses, but when we're doing the promotion of these trade agreements, uh, we do women-led uh, uh, trade missions and trying to put that central. So, so those are all some of the components, and I can feel the time writing out, but thanks very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much as well. Um, Ambassador May, you've been able to demonstrate how deliberate um, Canada has been starting actually from the change, you know, at the bottom, you're driving that grassroots approach and being able to kind of reach in everyone when you're doing the design. And from what I've been able to see, the gender mainstreaming 
has come as a result of that deliberate move to create a systemic change. I think that is something we can all learn from, real institutionalizing of these reforms and uh, the component on training. I think in your closing remarks, you can just share um, in brief, how then do you think the feminist lens that has been put in Canada's national policy framework brings experience to its international assistance, including multilateral cooperation in supporting gender equality and women empowerment. But the next speaker, um, I'm delighted to introduce to us Ms. Xing Li, Vice President of the Chinese Academy of Fiscal Sciences, Ministry of Finance of China. Thank you very much for being here. We are privileged to have you join us. And we know that from the perspective of financing, you could be able to talk more about the fiscal policies that have prioritized inclusive financing and addressing the specific needs and services for the women and girls. So back to you, uh, Ms. Xing. How do you use the development financing mechanism or national budgeting mechanism to enable resourcing and funding flows and address the issues around social welfare? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. As um, a woman at such a special occasion, it's a pleasure to be here. And also, I've worked in the fiscal field for 30 years. It is my pleasure to introduce to you how Chinese uh, physical policies support uh, on gender equality. We know. Fiscal investment is important to health and development of uh, women. Also, fiscal policies uh, can play a certain guiding roles, which should not be overlooked. So I would like to share with you the following four aspects on how Chinese fiscal policies. Uh, and first, uh, on the level of budgeting, which uh, offers a protection uh, for uh, women's rights and interests in terms of a women's health, the fiscal investment it has been increasing over the years, in particular in recent years on a maternity and disease screening, health check, and uh, women child care institutions and capacity uh, efforts have uh, uh, Redoubled it take 2022, for example, for public uh, hospital expenditure on in terms of women and children hospital is uh, 9.91 billion, and for women and child care is on 17.9 billion yuan. And uh, people participating in the insurance is already 246 million 2022. People that uh, benefit um, on an benefited more than 176 million people and we uh, spend 95 billion rmb on the insurance for women and children so these are the fiscal uh, protection a second is on uh, the coordination of capital and uh, we've uh, strengthened the coordination to uh, build a uh, better disbursement system to guarantee the protection of rights interest of women and girls you know the human flow in china is rapid so across the country we coordinate the remaining fund in the insurance accounts of different provinces and so we coordinated actually over 270 billion RMB, which effectively uh, relieved the burden of certain uh, places that had deficits. We also continue to improve in the uh, burden sharing system between central and local governments, for example, when it comes to inoculation, uh, which is funded by both central and provincial uh, governments. Some uh, provinces actually uh, cover uh, the premarital health check, which is also funded uh, by provincial and municipal and even county governments. So these uh, policies actually gather uh, no benefit to everyone, in particular women. It injects a new uh, protection to women's health. And next is tax um, benefits. We will launch a portfolio of uh, policies to uh, increase women's participation in the labor force. One example is Guangdong province. 
which in 2022 launched what is called a mama position. So mama can choose positions that offer flexible working hours, uh, which can on allow women to uh, have more control of work-life balance. And for companies that offer such flexible uh, positions to women, they enjoy subsidies and tax breaks from the government. And uh, based on our tracking and surveys, and this mama position help to uh, produce uh, triple benefits. So women participation in labor force, and uh, women health and also productivity of companies. We also have a tax uh, specific policies, for instance, on the uh, child um, care benefits are exempted from uh, personal income taxation. And that is done to reduce the burdens of families and women. And next is to optimize the relationship between market and government so that the fiscal policies can better uh, leverage the market. Take a career development as an example of fiscal and financial policies work hand in hand. In 2019, the Ministry of Finance just a measure to on uh, Provide to improve the subsidizing policy to support women entrepreneurship. The PBOC, People's Bank of China, also introduced a policy to support entrepreneurship and employment of women, which uh, incentivizes local governments to work with women organizations, including Federation, to uh, launch financial products, which could uh, benefit entrepreneurship and employment of women. After the policies were launched, there was a, a loan product called Women on uh, loan product that offers flexible repayment options and uh, uh, subsidies for women. And uh, so with um, uh, these uh, government policies uh, in the uh, private sector is incentivized, for example, Ant Finance and Goldman Sachs actually uh, launched a uh, education loan program for women and girls. And so that also facilitated uh, generation equality and uh, uh, and female uh, empowerment and that benefits both the government benefit but also uh, the market so that is how the market plays a guiding role well thank you in addition we also have uh, many different policies i have simply given out uh, some uh, examples we know that the two sessions are happening at the moment and in the recent uh, government report and they have also made a lot of arrangement for women and one of which is uh, to uh, further perfect uh, the maternity leave uh, package for women and uh, to find different uh, channels uh, to reduce uh, the burden of uh, families in raising kids and educating their children. So this kind of uh, policies will be more um, inducive uh, for women's achievements uh, in their career. And uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Clear and systematic approach that you've taken. And uh, because of time, I won't really reiterate, but we do appreciate just flexible working hours and providing incentives to the companies that have been able to empower women those flexi hours and introducing the tax breaks. So these are the tangible outcomes I think we are seeing from the policy incentives. And when you're making your last remark, we'll be able to ask you, how then does the Ministry of Finance ensure and enable the utilization of budgets for the interventions? You've named a few interventions aimed at protecting the rights of women and girls. So from the ministry's perspective, how then do they utilize budgets towards protection of the rights of women and girls here in China? But uh, without further ado, I would like to welcome us to UNFPA representative to China and country director of UNFPA in Mongolia, Madam Justine Colson. A uh, very warm welcome. And we know that you've been um, a leading advocate for sexual and reproductive health and rights. What are the modalities and approaches that the UNFPA is working with governments, especially to incentivize the financing and strategies to enable increased access to sexual health and reproductive health. Thank you. 
Great, thank you so much, Claire. So, um, so UNFPA, I mean, as you mentioned, is the agency that has this particular focus on sexual and reproductive health and rights, and we've had an increasing focus in recent years about moving from traditional development assistance to really trying to leverage financing to achieve universal access to sexual and reproductive health and rights, which is, sits as a target under both SDG 3 and SDG 5. And the reason why that's important, we've already talked about the size of the SDG funding gap. So ODA is never going to be the solution. But the other thing we're experiencing as a UN agency is that more and more of our countries are MIC countries, middle income countries, very often lower middle income countries who very suddenly find themselves no longer eligible for ODA, particularly in health, yet they still have very high sexual and reproductive health needs. So a key element of UNFPA's work on leveraging financing for SRH has been to put together the evidence to show why investment in sexual and reproductive health is a sound investment, not just for women, but for the economy and for the society as a whole. And just to be clear before I explain that, achieving universal access to SRHR is always about saving women's and girls' lives and, and uh, improving their well-being, and it's always a critical component of realizing women's rights and achieving gender equality and women's empowerment. But such an investment can also make an important contribution to a country's economic and social development. And this type of proactive reframing is important because very often an investment in sexual and reproductive health is just seen as a woman's issue or it's seen as a seen as important or is clearly directly linked to economic development as investing in education and skills or infrastructure or job creation. But the evidence shows something very, very different. So UNFPA works with countries across Asia and Africa with this common methodology to develop national sexual and reproductive health investment cases in partnership with governments. And this is really to show what the potential economic gains can be when there's very focused investment in certain components of sexual and reproductive health. Now, these case studies are very, very complex, and I don't have um, time to go into the detail here, but I mean, just as top line figures, what we can show is that for every $1 spent on improving maternal health services and increasing access to contraception can yield up to an $8.40 benefit for the economy over time. We see an gr even greater return on investment in ending child marriage, where $1 can yield up to a $33 return. So having gathered this information, we then need to go and advocate for the money. So we need to go and turn up and meet with the Minister of Finance saying, look, if you make this investment, this is not just good for women, this is not just good for families, but it really does make a sizable contribution to your national budget and to your um, national development. Um, we've also been using that evidence to go to the multilateral development banks, who don't always think first and foremost of sexual reproductive health as a critical investment to, to achieve the economic development that they want to support in their beneficiary countries. And this evidence is also particularly important because actually for many of the countries that are maybe represented today by some of their ambassadors, um, the discussion around universal health coverage is moving further and further and further up the agenda. And actually for the ambassador from Rwanda, the ambassador from South Africa, these have been critical issues in, in those two countries recently. But what happens when people start talking about universal health coverage and we start talking about national health insurance, there's it's instantly a big discussion about what's in the package, what's in the package of core health services. And very often that discussion jumps very quickly to non-communicable diseases. We start thinking about how can we develop a better response to cancers, for example, or to obesity or to diabetes and very often sexual and reproductive health that has maybe had good investment over the last 20 years is left behind as maybe a little bit of an old fashioned concern or something that's already been dealt with. And so when we put this evidence on the table, it really makes a difference. And I saw the one minute, but I'm just gonna make my point about private sector as well. 
Because it's not just about public sector. As we've heard, private sector has a massive role to play. We have 34 million women across the Asia region who work in the garment, textile, and footwear industries. If we invest in sexual and reproductive health in the workplace, we can also see great returns for businesses. So our return on investment tool closed very close shows very clearly that if a company invests in sexual and reproductive health, they can increase productivity by up to 15%. They can reduce absenteeism by up to 62%, and they can reduce staff turnover by up to 46%. So it is a truly, truly sound investment. And I'm just going to finish by saying that this year is the 30th year since the International Conference on Population Development, when all the countries represented in this room came together to say historically in Cairo that it is a woman's right to choose, it continues to be a woman's right to choose, and we need to invest in that choice. Thank you. Wow. So well put together. Thank you so much, um, Madam Justine, for that great um, summary and telling us the role of public policy advocacy. Um, this is what um, evidence has gone a long way to play in trying to really mitigate the issues around gender equality. So thank you for showing us and demonstrating the evidence, even linking to the potential economic gains our nations can make and even are currently making from some of these intentional policy moves and frameworks. Now, it is my sincere pleasure to welcome our last panelist, um, Ms. Dong Kui, Secretary General for China Women's Development Fund. And Ms. Ms. Dong Kui, you've been able to really, um, as the largest foundation in China, we're keen to learn about your sharing on the interventions, the partnerships, and funding mechanisms spearheaded by the fund to address the gender disparities we've had here and contribute to the poverty alleviation efforts by the country. So from your perspective and experience, what is your take on the opportunities of broadening and diversifying financial instruments for gender equality and women empowerment? Over to you. Ah. Ah. Thank you very much uh, for giving me this uh, opportunity and uh, participating in today's uh, forum as uh, from our uh, fund and from China's uh, Women's Development Fund, uh, which is an NGO. And uh, just now I have heard from many other speakers from a government perspective. And for me, I come from a charity and uh, I will mainly focus on the actual practice that we have done. And we know that uh, for charities, and uh, we often play a very important role in this uh, area. And for instance, uh, in terms of of uh, uh, China Women's Development uh, F, uh, CWDF, and uh, we are under the leadership of uh, the China's Women's Federation. It's a bit 36 years of our establishment, and we continue to adhere to one principle, which is uh, to continue to promote women's empowerment and the sustainable development of women. Our total social resources is about 9.2 billion RMB. Over 90% of those would be allocated to women in difficulties, and we have provided help to over 2 billion Chinese women. And we have also heard from many different countries in terms of your experience. And we look at the guarantee of sanitation and the care for their health and the empowerment work and agenda improve their capabilities, capacity building, as well as support for their families. So in those areas, we would design a series of charity programs. And in terms of some of the brands that we have built up, and perhaps some of our Chinese peers have heard about this, and which is the Chinese Mother's Drinking Program, and which is to provide clean drinking water. And we also have another program and which is uh, uh, called uh, the 
Chinese uh, healthcare bus, and basically for women, you can go to this uh, bus, and it travels around the country and uh, to uh, provide uh, uh, health services to women, and pregnant women could also have access to doctors' uh, uh, diagnosis, etc. And uh, for all of these uh, uh, projects that have been written in the white paper of uh, Chinese government uh, history of poverty alleviation and reduction, and uh, in 2021, we have also been granted uh, the consultative uh, status uh, uh, by the United Nations of Women, and uh, with uh, the uh, development uh, over time, and we continue to iterate, uh, continue to upgrade ourselves, and we continue to call on the importance uh, of empowerment, and we focus uh, on the development of women. And for instance, uh, we have um, a, a program uh, called uh, um, love her, and uh, this program is uh, to connect the economy together with the digital economy. And for instance, we provide loans. This is in Wuxi, and provide them with some employment opportunities, uh, and to help women in difficulty, to give them opportunities uh, to flourish and to realize their independence. I would also like to share with you just now, we have uh, heard from our previous uh, uh, speaker and uh, together with uh, UNDP, and we heard uh, Ms. Uh, Trunkman mention about this, and I uh, believe that you have a uh, uh, recollection of these uh, projects. And uh, for instance, we have uh, helped with the uh, local women to develop their uh, green ecology uh, development and uh, to help them with uh, countryside uh, tourism. This is a beautiful village and has also been able to maintain their traditional culture and their legacy. So this is from a project's perspective. Uh, just now, you have also asked us about our uh, financial mechanism. And so as uh, a national charity, and uh, we often follow one theme, and which is uh, common prosperity. And uh, grasping on this uh, theme, and we continue to talk about uh, with our partners uh, across all sectors, and this is based on our common value value and together with the corporate partners and in terms of their CSR targets, for instance, some of our SOEs and in terms of their earmarked areas for their help, for instance, they can help them to establish their clean drinking projects and for instance, with a Budweiser and with a real and uh, we work with them and as a very important part of uh, realizing their ESG targets. And in recent years, we also work with the Tencent, Alibaba, as well as Alipay's uh, charity uh, platforms. And uh, we uh, call on uh, public donations from everyone in the society. And in terms of uh, our project implementation, through going into the basic level and the fundamental level, and so uh, we are able to gather, uh, for instance, uh, uh, experts uh, and uh, forces uh, from uh, all these uh, specific areas, uh, and for instance, from education, from clean drinking water, sanitation, and for instance, uh, through third parties, uh, oh, Assessment and for our mother's drinking water projects, the IRR is 5.6%, and our other mother's health bus, the project, and the IRR is 3.6%. And perhaps in the interest of time, I will stop here. I would also like to say that we look forward to working with more partners, more platforms, and for us, in terms of our experience, we would be able to bring it to the international stage and to attract more international partners and to support our development. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that marks the end of our session, but you'll allow each one of my panelists to just give a closing shot, a parting shot. There are some questions I'd ask some of them to add um, after their remarks. So we'll use one minute to give that last parting shot and just speak to one or two things that I had asked, maybe with no particular order. Right, I, as I said earlier, the institutions are very, very important for uh, some of these programs that have been mentioned to uh, take place, whether it is a Women Empowerment Fund, whether it is access to property, access to finance, when you have 61% women in parliament, when you have more than 50%
in, in cabinet, when you have more than 50% in judiciary, then you can pass any law. And this is why today, when we talk about business development fund, is a fund that guarantees women to get you know, loan without having equity. Yeah, we, or, or collateral, uh, the, the access to land, the new uh, matrimonial regime that allows women to inherit from their families and from uh, the, 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 the new families, so from the, the husbands or wife. So because of that institutional uh, uh, capacity, having women representation in those positions, then it allows the government to be able to pass the laws that are necessary to ensure uh, uh, gender equality and women empowerment. Thank you. Excellency. Yeah, In the interest of time, yeah. first, really, as I said, the issues of women empowerment are key to what we foresee as a shared prosperity as South African at the globe. And uh, now is not a time to despair. But as Nelson Mandela said, it always looks impossible until it's done. Thank you. Thank you. We need to go. The position of the, or status of women is one of the hallmarks of civilization of a country. The concept of gender equality must be integrated into the drafting, implementation, assessment, and improvement of the policymaking process. So from a multilateral project engagement process, I think the key thing is at what point and how are you engaging with women? So is it that you've developed your, pro your project and at the end you're going consulting women and ticking the box that yes, they've been consulted? Or do you start from the beginning and looking at women's needs, bringing them into the table? And so, for example, uh, is a water project going to be looking at the women's needs within that water usage um, and how to make their lives easier? Or are you starting with a, an economic livelihoods framework, and then saying, as a secondary benefit, it may improve women's lives. I thank you very much. The moderator asked me a question that I didn't get to answer, so I will utilize the opportunity now. Chinese fiscal policy values investment into gender equality, and when that is integrated into the budget, we have a budget law that guarantees it. So that's a legal obligation. And while the budgets are drafted now, we also have a KPI-based system. And so for the implementation of the budget, there is a whole KPI-based evaluation system. And from a target management to the implementation, there's a self-assessment and external assessment. Whenever a problem is identified, we'll rectify it. And that has uh, produced a substantial uh, results. And that's just a supplement. Well, for uh, my institute, I would like to conclude with one sentence. Well, my institute uh, is also a high-end think tank in China. In the future, we will dedicate also to accelerating uh, women progress related research. And I look forward to more cooperation and exchange with you all. Thank you. Um, I think no matter how many roads we build, how many trade deals we sign, how many jobs we create, if we do not have sustained investment in sexual and reproductive health, and gender equality and women's empowerment, we can never achieve sustainable, inclusive development. Uh, Gender equality is um, the common value for the mankind. Investing women help more women to live a fulfilled life. Could we give them a warm round of applause? <laughs> and okay, thank you, Ms. Mitchell, for the opportunity to moderate. And I think I will not add anything, but we've seen we need a multi-pronged approach from whether it's state actors or non-state actors to improve the public policy dimension. Thank you so much to my lovely audience. I, I really enjoyed this.